It's 10.30. Uh, seems like we have a pretty good crowd so far, so I'd like to welcome everybody to um, our cross-country share. This one's on wildfire. Today we're going to have uh, Zach from back east uh, speaking about their fire plan for uh, Resolute, and then out west we're going to have Daniel uh, from Interfor speaking about uh, what they call their humidity dome and how they saved their sawmill from last year's fire. So it, uh, there should be some pretty good learnings that we have today. Uh, and I think I'll pass it over to oh, Tom so you that you can introduce who's going to um, present from back east or introduce uh, Zach from back east. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Bill, for the introduction and welcome everyone. This is uh, a, another great opportunity for us to share information and learnings, uh, as we'll hear a lot from uh, during today's session. But I'll, I'll turn it over to one of our advisory committee members. Uh, Victor, I'll turn it over to you to provide the introduction for Zach. Perfect. Thanks, Tom. Um, hi, everyone. Victor McKee, the safety superintendent for Ontario uh, Resident Woodlands. Um, I've got uh, Zach here with us. He's our one of our operations um, coordinators and our fire safety coordinator for, for this year. And along with him, I have Sean Horan, the owner of Valley Fire Protection and Services Limited. Sean is our um, service Fire services contractor and our biggest ally to uh, to assist us with uh, with our contractors. So I um, thank you everybody for joining, and I will turn it over to Zach. And uh, I just want to make sure everybody can see that what uh, Zach has shared. Is that a yes? Everybody can see. Everyone can see what we're sharing. Everyone. Yep. Yeah, okay. We can see you here. Okay. Okay. So I'm, as Vic said, I'm Zach Jolliker. I'm the uh, I'm the operations forester on the Black Spruce Forest here, and I'm the uh, the lead within Resolute for our uh, fire prevention. So my role, I figured I would start with kind of our structure here. My role is to work daily with Sean uh, with the preparation. Of the for the fire season and then also throughout the fire season on our prevention and suppression efforts so like before the fire season i work with him to uh to determine our training and equipment needs for the year based on our our contractor base at the time and then my job is also to liaise information uh to our management team and to our operations staff of any sort of changing conditions and uh, or hazards and threats that might be facing our operation and along with myself on the weekends, we have a weekend fire officer who is uh, a woodland staff who is on call for the weekend. And they act as the point of contact for the MNR and for the contractors uh, if sort of any fire event does happen. So next we have Sean Haran, the owner of Valley Fire Protection and Services Limited. Uh, he's an external contractor who provides services to us. He's been doing that for 25 years. Uh, him and his team, they work uh, you know, really hard to support us and our contractors. And his knowledge and expertise, they're an invaluable asset to us and a, a major factor in our success. Um, so he, uh, help, he does a lot of our fire preparedness and awareness uh, before the fire season starts. He holds uh, meetings for our contractors. We get everyone together to uh, to go over the fire plan for the year, uh, kind of talk about an outlook, how things are going to look for the year, uh, fire threat wise and and preparedness. And then on a daily basis during the fire season, uh, he's sending out uh, uh, notes about the the bio uh, fire codes fire. Yeah, are you guys able to hear that? Yep. When when Sean Florida. speaks. Yes. All right. So he's he's sending out information uh, that we received from the MNR, like through my op of the uh, like the codes and things that are necessary for our our contractors on a daily basis. He's monitoring the weather and fire indices as well. 
he's the one who who puts on our our fire training like the sp100 for for our contractors if uh if they do have to fight a fire as well as uh uh, heavy equipment training and line locator training, the SP-160 and SP-403. Um, he also does compliance inspections throughout the year with our contractors and joint with the uh, the MNR. And he supplies and services our, our fire suppression equipment every year. Uh, that's kind of a short summary of uh, of what he does. Is there anything else that that I missed or that I should have? I do a lot of liaison work with the company and, uh, and the MNR, the government agencies, and kind of a point of contact for the uh, for the MNR. Okay, so the next thing I'll talk about is is MIOP, Modified Industrial Operation Protocol, and that's uh, legislated through the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. Um, and this is this is right out of the, the MIOP. It, it just directs us on fire prevention and suppression so that we can operate uh, safely during the fire season. So it's to ensure that we're operating in a manner that prevents wildfires from starting and minimizes uh, the impact when fires do start. Try to keep them as small as possible, uh, and it ensures that uh, that there these fires are detected and reported, and that employees are adequately trained when they are operating during fire season. So this that's probably hard to tell what this is, but our contractors operate within this this pamphlet on a daily basis. This. It classifies contractors' risk based off of uh, off their the number of machines and the type of machines, what sort of operation they're running, and it also classifies their field group that they're operating in and determines their operational modifications uh, based on the intensity codes and and the risk that they're they're operating within. And this is the other half of that pamphlet for determining the the field groups to to determine what sort of modifications they might have to operate within, uh, whether if the risk is high, whether they're doing short shifts or or shut down, or if it's just normal prevention measures. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, I got a quick question about this pamphlet. It's basically like a risk assessment to to a degree. Who created this pamphlet? Is this something that we were given to us by an outside agency, or is this something that that we and Sean built together so that our contractors had this as a template to use? Ash, I can I can that works. So um, back in two thousand and eight, or prior to two thousand and eight, we had what's called the Woods Mods, which was an early version of this. Um, there was an initiative between industry and government to revamp that woods mod system. And this MIOP is, is the result of that modification. And basically it looks at the operational risk by machines. And that's the, the potential for starting a fire, your rock to metal contact. And then looking at the, uh, the fuel classification with respect to how intense a fire will become. And then, you know, using those two pieces of information along with the fire indices, it'll lay out whether you can operate or can't operate based on that operational risk in the fire hazard. So it was it was a joint venture to develop it between industry and the government. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so so with that, our contractors on a daily basis are tracking their fuel groups within their harvest blocks you know they can have a couple depending on on what it looks like depending on the rockiness depending on what species they're cutting whether it's hardwood or softwood there's different risks associated with that and they're tracking that on a daily basis and that's documented with them as well if anything were to happen then they can can look back and uh, sort of explain their decision to uh, why they were operating or 
Yeah. So, yeah, unless, uh, unless you guys have anything else to add, there's, uh, yeah, if you guys feel free to ask us any questions. So we'll op open it up to questions from the group. Does anybody have any questions? So, um, Zach, a, a quick question regarding the, some of the work that you're doing. Does it also include any of your manufacturing facilities in, in your planning? Uh, this, is just, this is just for operations in the bush. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, that's just, just for the woodlands operations. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the dynamics now with, with Resolute, we, the pulp of paper mill that's in Thunder Bay is no longer Resolute. It was sold last year. So we have the three sawmills in Thunder Bay, Atacope, and Ignace, and they're separate from this plant. This is just the woodlands operation, the harvesting aspect. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Zach or anyone else in the group from Thunder Bay? Well, we will have uh, time right at the end of the presentation for additional questions, if there are any. Zach, uh, thanks very much. Uh, oh, I see a hand coming up. Frank, go ahead. So I guess my question is just like, do you have a, you have a it looks like a great management system. How does that reflect the actual mitigation of the fires? If, would you get it fires or, or does it affront and reflect this at all? Sean? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. So the whole but point of, go ahead. I guess what I'm looking at, I mean, I know in our area I'm having some frustrations. I know a lot of people out in the forest and and how the we're actually dealing with fires. So you know, my my point is like we could have all the best systems in the world, but how does that reflect the actual uh, controlling of of burns and stuff, or or does it at all, or or you no? Know, Okay. That, that's yeah, my so, concern, though. Yeah, so the, um, I guess that's a MIOP question, and the, the whole intent with MIOP is to reduce the risk of fires. It doesn't eliminate fires from happening. It reduces okay. the risk of them occurring. And, okay, and, so uh, that's and, fine. I, so that's yeah. what you're just, this is all based on just reducing the risk of, of the fire. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, but part of the system with my op, you know, aside from reducing, it's putting things in place so that we're better prepared to deal with a fire should one occur. That's where the training comes in and the equipment requirements that are listed in my op come in. And and it is a self-regulating process, if you will. However, if we're if if we start a fire and we're not following my op, then it opens up to potential uh, exposure. And that's that's part of my role with the compliance inspections is to make sure they have the proper equipment, the proper number of trained people, and that they're actually applying my off correctly to reduce those risks. Yeah, so Sean's in the field during during fire season auditing uh, the the application of my op. And like for example, here, like it outlines uh, based on the number of machines you have. Uh, what sort of fire equipment is necessary? So, like, you need you need pack hands on each machine. If you have more than if you have six or more machines, you need uh, a fire cache. Or if you have a chipper, you need a fire cache no matter what. Um, and these are the things that uh, that Sean is out there auditing, and that our our operations people are auditing and, and making sure that uh, that it's being implemented. Like like we said, so in in the case that there is a fire, uh, people are able to to action it effectively. Any, any other questions? 
Craig, did that did that clear things up for you, Craig? Yeah, I, I'll accept that. Yeah. Okay. And just to, just to add, I mean, uh, if, I'm not trying to read between the lines, but if you, you're asking, we have the the right management structure set up for the fire season. And that management structures are directly reflected by our contractors and their buy-in in the process. So they buy into the process, and we can see that with the responses that we're getting back from them and the the audits that Sean does when he conducts his compliance audits. Resolute also conducts compliance audits with all of its contractors periodically throughout the course of the summer, throughout the year for that matter, with regards to emergency preparedness and fire being the, the main one during the summer. So we, we do get the buy-in from our contractors um, and it's not an, it's not an option on, on Resolute's part uh, for our contractors to have that buy-in. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions uh, for Zach, Sean, or Victor, I'll turn it back to you, Bill, uh, for our next presentation. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, uh, Zach, uh, Sean, and Victor for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to see, you know, the, your process that you have there with your, your flashcards for the risk assessments seems to be a nice, simple, and easy thing for people to follow. So, you know, that's that's good to see. Uh, for yeah, our next present, oh, sorry. Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, that's a great tool that uh, that you can keep with you in the field that is uh, is effective on a day to day basis. Yeah, that's right. So I'd like to introduce da Daniel Ruzik from Interfor. Uh, as everyone knows, BC had some pretty significant fires last year, um, and the Adams Lake sawmill was under threat uh, from a, a wildfire, um, and it. That Daniel's going to present on the efforts and the work that uh, they they took to basically protect to protect the sawmill because uh, it uh, it was right in the path of the fire. So Daniel, I'll I'll pass it over to you. Awesome, thanks for the intro, Bill. And I'm just trying to share my screen, but it's not letting me. I wonder if whoever's sharing right now can stop sharing. There you go, try that. Okay, I think we're good. Everyone should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect, awesome. Yeah, so as Bill mentioned, um, we had a pretty unprecedented fire season in the British Columbia interior last year. Um, I, I'll introduce myself and kind of just get into it and kind of some things that we did that helped save our operation. So, uh, my name is Daniel Ruzik. I am the EHS superintendent for our BC interior operations. Um, so we have three manufacturing facilities and woodlands operations in the BC interior that I'm responsible for. I'm actually based out of the Adams Lake operation, which is our largest facility. And uh, I personally live in Kamloops, which is uh, about an hour west of the mill site. Um, so here's kind of an uh, intro of where we are located in British Columbia. So it's about a four-ish hour drive east from Vancouver, right in the middle of the interior where we get very hot, dry summers basically every year. Um, so the site itself, it's a fairly large footprint. Um, we manufacture about 350 million board feet at this site um, and uh, have about 250 direct inner four employees that work at the sawmill and about 250 or so indirect uh, employees that uh, work in in our forestry operations. So yeah, big employer for the region and uh, we're located in a pretty rural setting. So almost in the middle of nowhere and uh, you know, our employees come from sort of all over. Um, there's about 10 or so fairly significant communities that are near the mill where our employees travel to. So uh, I'll just kind of give you a bit of a timeline of 2023 and then uh, work through some of the things that helped us uh, prevent catastrophic loss at this site. So July 12th, uh, 
uh, is when things kind of started here in this area. Uh, that's when two wildfires started um, nearby the mill. So uh, it was called both of these fires, the Bush Creek East Fire and the Lower East Adams Lake Fire. They were discovered on July 12th as a result of lightning. Um, both those fires didn't do a whole lot. So they kind of just burned. They didn't grow substantially. Um, and they were left essentially unattended by BC Wildfire Services and were based and pretty much out of the scope of our operating footprint to uh, to be able to deal with them. Pretty challenging terrain, very steep, rocky terrain that we had no access to. Uh, so the fires kind of did their thing for a few weeks um, until kind of towards the end of July and in early August, uh, we saw an increase in fire activity due to pretty consistent hot, hot temperatures with zero precipitation, um, a couple weather events that had some pretty significant wind and uh, basically caused these fires to grow. Um, on August 9th was a big day. Uh, the fires, both of the fires exploded in growth, um, caused significant fire activity directly across uh, the lake from the mill site. So that's the two pictures that you see there. So it's across the lake, that one fire, that's the Lower East Adams fire, uh, essentially kind of blew up that day, uh, caused a pretty spectacular view for us on this side of the lake and uh, enforced several evacuation orders to homes and properties on the other side of the lake and caused an evacuation alert area on our side of the lake. So that point we, um, Started to panic a little bit. Um, we essentially curtailed operations at the mill and sent our employees home just for their safety in case the fires kind of traveled over to our side of the lake or if the other Bush Creek fire made its way closer to the to the mill. Um, on August 10th, we really started to hit our worst case scenario preparations and planning. So uh, with the mill curtailed, um, gave us an opportunity to really prepare the site for if the fires did reach reach us. Uh, and then on August 18th, so about a week or so of preparing is when uh, the big firestorm event occurred. That's when we hit crossover conditions, which I'll explain in a later slide. Both of those two fires merged into one massive fire. Uh, it caused massive evacuations in uh, the communities surrounding the mill um, and significant fire damage to several communities. So very devastating situation. Um, so here's just some, uh, some stats on the fire itself. This map shows uh, the fire size. So the mill, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the mill is basically located right where the Adams Lake words are. Um, where the fires started initially, where kind of in this top left area here was the initial uh, Bush Creek fire, uh, and then the Lower East Adams fire started, originated in kind of this location here, directly across, across the mill. So eventually 46,000 or over 46,000 hectares were burned. Um, there was impact to 10 or more communities. So you can see that there's quite a few communities that are listed on this map here. Um, Chase is a highly populated, well, it's a smaller community, but there's a lot of our mill population comes from Chase. Um, there's the Sorrento area here, which is evacuated, Blind Bay. Um, on the north shore of the Shushwap Lake, all these communities here were evacuated. Um, at the end of it all, there was over 176 structures that were totally lost. Um, there is extensive infrastructure damage to the region, so roads, bridges, power lines, uh, all gone. Um, at one point, 75% uh, of our employees at the mill were either on evacuation order or alert, plus the mill was down, so, you know, highly stressful situation for all of our employees. Uh, and we ended up being down for six weeks as a result. Reason for that length is uh, getting infrastructure back to the site. So uh, a main bridge was damaged, badly damaged to the mill site. So we weren't even, even able to access it by a road. And um, all the power poles, I can't remember what the count was, but it was significant, like 
thousand power poles or something were burnt in the fire. So uh, major BC hydro infrastructure work had to get completed before we can get power restored to the site. So really a huge, huge impact to uh, to our mill and our employees and the whole region uh, last summer. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time if anyone has any questions. Here's a picture. This was taken on August 18th, so this was kind of the big day. Um, so this photo is taken from just outside our planer mill, looking up towards the main office. So you can see this uh, is the mill's main office building here. Um, the sawmill building is kind of in the shadows here. You can actually see some sprinklers running and the ground is wet. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, pretty scary situation. So I'll just talk about our wildfire strategy. So it goes, you know, basically been years in the making. Um, it all starts with our forest management. So over the last few years, there's been a ton of work in our woods around the mill site just to basically reduce fuel load. So cleaning the forest floor from any dead fall or anything like that. Um, and also the uh, um, putting in strategic fire breaks. Um, so a couple of photos here. So the photo on the left is actually during the fire, as you can see one of our strategic fire breaks uh, there. And then the two photos on the right, the one in the middle is uh, a fire break that we put in um, kind of days before the fire reached the mill. So this was kind of our last ditch effort in a break. Uh, we called it uh, Larry's Guard. And it was, you know, essentially a football field size guard between uh, the forest and our and the, the border of our mill site. Uh, you can see on the photo on the right, that's the same guard. So the fire did actually uh, hit that guard, but uh, fortunately it didn't have enough uh, fuel to spread over onto our mill site. Uh, emergency response planning. So there's a lot that went into this. Um, so kind of on August 10th there, when the fires started to grow in size and become a, a risk or a threat, uh, we implemented an incident, incident command center. That was a joint operation with our woodlands department, uh, myself and our manufacturing team, and then also uh, some partnership with the BC wildfire services that were in the area. Uh, so at those meetings, we would review and revise our daily emergency response plans, depending on the activities or the risk for the day. Um, we would obviously track attendance and have a check-in system for anyone that's either working on the mill site for doing the wildfire preparations or anyone that was working in the woods actually actioning the fire. Um, we had really good communication lines with BC Wildfire Services. So we you know we were considered and we consider them a partner in all of this. So um, kind of daily briefings and activities joint with them. Uh, we try to stay into in constant communication with our staff and employees. Um, we didn't have a lot of employees on site. Everyone was essentially laid off due to the mill being curtailed, um, but still keeping them updated with sort of what was going on at the mill and uh, and just keeping them informed to kind of keep stress levels as low as possible in, in what became an extremely stressful time for everyone. Uh, we also had to look at our egress and evacuation routes. Um, so as the fire moved, our evacuation routes had to change as well. So we had to go and reactivate some roads and kind of come up with contingency plans. One of our contingency plans was actually evacuation by boat. And uh, that was kind of plan Z and we actually ended up having to use that. So things were very dynamic and constantly were changing. Uh, we also ensured that our key people that were on site um, knew what their responsibilities were and, and we had a good chain of command structure. Um, it was important for us to also identify critical infrastructure in case it went out and have a backup plan for that. So of course, power was a, a real concern for us. So getting things like backup generators, uh, lights, um, and even internet, it's a big deal, especially when it comes to communication. So uh, we had a Starlink set up on our site to provide internet service. So quite a bit to the ERP planning process. As far as the mill site itself, um, we had a few strategies. So uh, as soon as the fire exploded across the lake on April, or sorry, August, 
8th, whatever that date was there. Um, we began our kind of site prep. So that included fuel reduction. That was probably our biggest strategy. Um, so we ended up bringing back a small planer crew to convert as much rough, dry inventory to finished inventory. And uh, we opened up shipping lines. So essentially try to get our uh, shipping um, transport companies to ramp up and take all of our finished inventory off of our site. So we have some, we have a satellite yard that we use um, in Kamloops. So we had 100%, almost 100% of our finished inventory uh, removed off of our site. And also a big push to chuck away any of our residuals and byproducts so that they, they weren't in bins or sitting on the ground. So that was huge for us. <clears throat> and then on top of that, we put a lot of effort into site cleanup. So ensuring that all of our roads and yards were as clean as possible. So wood, debris, anything combustible essentially was removed or at least removed away from buildings. Uh, and then we also moved our mobile equipment and any of our, you know, expensive assets out of the fringes, out of our other yards and brought them into a kind of what we call the safe zone that was sprinklered and uh, kind of surrounded by either concrete or what we thought was a safe location. Some additional measures that we did is seal all the buildings. So you can imagine our sawmill infeeds and outfeeds, big openings to the inside. So sealing those areas off. Closing vents, um, making sure all the doors were closed up. So uh, kind of trying to seal the buildings as tight as possible so that a potential spark couldn't enter the facility. Um, the mill, I should mention the mill is uh, all the water is 100% fed from the lake. So the good thing about this site specifically is we essentially have an endless supply of water. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could use all the water we could and not have any pumps fail. So we brought in auxiliary fuel tanks, diesel tanks to each of our two pump locations. And those essentially had enough fuel to run uh, about 40 hours. So if we were forced to evacuate the site, we could just turn on the pumps and our sprinkler systems and know that we're pretty good for about 40 hours of runtime there. And of course we had around the clock patrols. So we had key personnel kind of designated to patrol the site and look for any potential embers or hot spots or anything that were uh, that could enter the, the site. And probably the biggest thing that saved our operation is sprinklers. So uh, we had about the, the nice and, or the lucky part about this whole situation is that we had about a week to 10 days to prepare for this. So fortunately we had time on our side. Um, one thing I will note is there was a break in the weather at one point and we're kind of thinking the worst was over. Maybe we should get back to running our operation. Um, it's a good thing we didn't because things took a turn for the worse after that and uh, and all of our preparations and, and diligence um, paid off in the end. So what we did is we set up over 100 sprinklers around our site. Um, 23 of those were fireboss units, which I'll touch on in the next slide. Um, and we had a crew dedicated to sprinkler management. So we had all of our sprinklers kind of running on an interval to ensure that the whole site was kept wet and that we had humidity in the air at all times. So the fireboss sprinkler system, uh, this is just a snap or a snip off of their website. So um, you can just Google Fireboss and their website will appear. But essentially, um, they provided us or we purchased from them a bunch of their sprinklers. So they have two different models. There's a Fireboss Magnum and the Fireboss Mini. So uh, Magnum, of course, is a larger version. Um, so they're pretty cool units. They're uh, very portable and, uh, and work really good to shoot out a pretty awesome spray of water. Um, so this, yeah, just a little snip from their website, which is kind of neat. So uh, this is how it works. So picture on the bottom there is uh, is what the sprinkler unit actually looks like. You can get them so that they hook onto a two inch or one and a half inch fire line. Um, so essentially what it does is uh, by removing heat, um, so remove heat by cooling the fuels to prevent ignition. Uh, projection of water over a massive area, 
and injection of vapor into the atmosphere to create a humidity bubble. So this picture kind of shows what we're trying to achieve, and I think we did. Um, so by having this vapor and moisture kind of constantly being spread across uh, a large area, you, you, you're able to achieve a lower relative humidity. Um, so if the theory is if a spark is making its way to your area, um, it gets extinguished before it can actually land on the ground or land on some lumber or a building. <clears throat> I'll mention crossover. So for those of you that don't know what this is, and I didn't until last year, so crossover conditions is as air temperature readings increase and relative humidity readings decrease during the day, burning conditions will become more intense. So certain atmospheric conditions can produce severe fire behavior, reaching a point when the air temperature reading and the relative humidity reading will read the same. So the 30-30 is kind of that, uh, that sweet spot. So at this point, a condition has been achieved called crossover. So this graph kind of gives you a good idea. So time of day plays into this. So, uh, you know, around noon or one, the hottest time of the day, relative humidity drops, uh, the temperature outside increases, and that's when you get your maximum fire intensity. So when the fire ripped through the Adams Lake kind of area, we were in those crossover conditions. Um, temperatures, I can't remember exactly that day, but they were certainly in over that 30 degree Celsius range and relative humidity, you know, probably around that range as well, 30% or so. Um, what we were able to do on the mill with our kind of sprinkler strategy is create this humidity dome. So you can see on this chart here, this was taken, this reading was taken a couple of days before the fire went through. Um, but essentially relative humidity, or sorry, the temperature outside was 26.5. Uh, that was three kilometers away from the mill in the forest. Uh, in the sawmill protected area, it was uh, over a degree cooler than that. And then our relative humidity varied. So it was, you know, 38% uh, percent in the forest uh, and it was 50% on our sawmill area. So pretty massive change in relative humidity. So we're able to kind of defer that crossover condition on the actual mill site. So everywhere around us was at that maximum fire intensity where the mill site itself kind of was in its own little bubble and a bit of a protected zone there. Um, that's kind of all I had. I'll just give you some kind of picture tour. But um, so the photo on the left there is, um, I'm not sure what the date is, but it's leading up to the August 18th day. Um, so it's just a picture of our log yard. So we try to remove as much log inventory as we could off the land and put it into the lake or ship it away. Um, and that's where we ended up parking our mobile equipment fleet. So big paved area with attic, like really good sprinkler protection. So we figured that was uh, probably the safest zone to park a few million dollars worth of equipment. Um, the picture on the right is a photo of uh, our residual towers. So the on the left of this picture is our sawdust bin. You can see there's sprinklers. Uh, those are fire boss sprinklers on the top of the bins. And on top of our hog conveyor towers as well. So we try to get as many sprinklers as we could on higher elevation. So you get a bigger spray and more kind of vapor or moisture in the air. So that was our, our kind of key strategy with the fire boss sprinkler units is to get them up as high as we could. Uh, this picture here at top left is just a photo of our the road along the perimeter of our site. So we had uh, sprinkler protection on the roads kind of around the site protecting the perimeter. Um, picture right below that is just a picture of the fire boss magnum. So that's a large unit hooked up to a fire hydrant and that's uh, spraying down our log yard area. And you can see, uh, you can't see, but we also had sprinklers on the roof of the sawmill and all of our buildings up here as well. Picture on the right is uh, this is where we moved any of our uh, rough inventory that we couldn't convert to finished uh, that had to stay on site. We put into one yard um, and had it really like sprinkler like crazy. So we had a another pump running from the lake that supplied water to this yard and uh, you know essentially soaked it down. Uh, video here just kind of shows you 
one of our fire boss sprinklers on top of hog tower. You can see it's just you know, creates a huge mist and covers a large area. It can cover about a spray of about 100 feet uh, in distance, and they can go 360 around. Uh, picture up top, oops, oops. This picture here on the top right just shows you, you know, how smoky and nasty the conditions were for, you know, most of the summer anyways, um, but you can see all the sprinklers running in different areas. Um, if it was blowing up a little bit more, you could see there's literally sprinklers all over the place. Oops, and then the picture here on the bottom is just kind of our, our rainforest conditions that we created in our residual areas. So obviously a pretty high hazard area with wood debris on the ground. So uh, had that sprinkler really well. Here's a picture of the fire border. So you can see the fire came through. It was heading right towards us. Um, you know, it did actually get to this where my cursor is here. That's our, our top yard area where we have a bit of a boneyard and we have some storage and our mobile shop is up here. So it actually made it to this area here right on the fringes of our property. Same thing. This is that guard that caught on fire or we had it cut off. It never actually made it to our uh, rough inventory yard. Um, so basically made it right up to here, here, and then just skirted around and totally bypassed the mill. Um, so, you know, I think if we didn't take the measures that we did to protect the site, um, I wouldn't be speaking to you today from my office. Um, so, you know, a ton of effort went into uh, protecting the site and making sure that our employees had a job to come back to after after that horrible summer. Um, I guess maybe the last thing I'll mention is um, partnership with BC Wildfire Services is pretty nice because of such an active situation in the whole region. Um, they used us as kind of almost like a safe zone. Um, they helped us in the early days with some, um, some fire protection. And when the fire rolled through, they came to our site um, they were man or directed to come help protect our site. They showed up on August 18th, realized that we were totally covered and considered our site a safe zone. So it was nice. We were able to defer them to actually protecting as much of the community and the homes um, just south of us. So, um, you know, knowing that they had a safe, you know, a safe zone, our site was protected, they had an area they can stage their equipment and then work their way down and, and try to save as many homes as possible. So huge joint uh, kind of partnership there with the wildfire services. But yeah, it's a pretty exciting summer. Hope to never have to relive that again. <laughs> and yeah, open to answer any questions. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, that's pretty awesome. I think uh, what Intergrower had had done there, and I think you've uh, been able to share some pretty important information with everybody on potentially planning for the inevitable or possibly the catastrophic fires that can happen uh, close to manufacturing facilities that are, you know, not close to town. And I think there's a lot of them out there. So, so thank you very much. It was it was a great presentation. So. I see a hand up from Tom. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Great, thanks, Bill. And uh, Daniel, thanks for a fantastic presentation and congratulations to you and Inter for, for being successful in, in a pretty significant challenge with the fire. Um, one, the question I have is when these things happen, a lot of times we don't have a lot of advance notice and the structure that you built with sprinklers, hoses, uh, uh, generators, uh, uh, the question I have, was that difficult to bring together all that equipment so quickly uh, to meet your demands? Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, we did have a bit of time and that really, worked in our favor for sure. So um, we did have a pretty dedicated crew. We you know, initially came up with a list of, okay, what do we got to do to protect our site? Let's execute. You know, We brought in as many of our employees as we could. Um, fortunately, we weren't under evacuation order. We were under an alert. So we were technically sort of borderline able to be there. Um, so yeah, we just kind of hit the ground as hard as we could. And it took a lot of effort from not only our, you know, our mill employees, like our mill rights and mechanics to set all this up, 
but also our purchasing department making phone calls and trying to organize logistics of getting these generators and sprinklers from, you know, some of them are coming from Edmonton and, you know, we had the actually the fire boss uh, owner jumped in his truck and drove us sprinklers down from Edmonton. Like it was, it's pretty incredible what people will do when, um, when you're faced with this type of adversity. So yeah, for sure. If you had a, if, you know, if we had 24 hours to put this together, we'd probably be in a different situation, but fortunately we had, you know, days to work on this and uh, set us up for success. Great. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thanks. Okay, it looks like Matt, uh, you had your hand up second. Hey, thanks. Uh, just a quick question. Um, you obviously moved an enormous amount of water. Uh, I was wondering if you had any idea of roughly your pumping capacity that you needed to to achieve what you did. Um, yeah, we, to... our main fire pump is 3,500 GPM. Um, and that thing was running essentially 24 7, 20, yeah, 24 hours for solid five days. Um, so it was able to keep up the demand. We didn't drop any pressure or anything like that. Um, we did bring in some external fire pumps as well, and they actually did really well. Uh, what's the one brand called? Uh, I can't remember. I can send some information out too if anyone's interested, but there's this one pump that we had. And it was actually incredible the amount of volume that it would pump out. Great yeah, on, no, Noah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dell. Uh, Dell, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, um, Matt asked one of them already, which was uh, water supply, which is a huge issue for where our mill is. Uh, we don't have a lake around us, <laughs> which kind of uh, is nice. Um, you mentioned about having. Uh, uh, manpower around to monitor the pumps and all that stuff. You have a rough estimate of how much manpower you used your around the clock to maintain that stuff. Yeah, we had about three people around, three to five people during the night. And then during the day, we had a larger crew because we we're kind of constantly doing more and more to try to protect the site. So, um, up leading up to the August 18th fire day, I'd say three to four, three to five at night, and then a few more during the day. Um, and then after the fire, so when the fire rolled through on the 18th, um, we were evacuated or like forced out. Fortunately, part of our ERP planning was that uh, we had an agreement with BC Wildfire Services that we can actually keep um, up to five of our key personnel on site under their supervision and direction. And the purpose of that is just to ensure that the pumps were running, um, that everything was kind of in order, and so that we can support them in kind of firefighting efforts uh, in the community um, just south of us. So uh, when that fire rolled through, we were all evacuated. Our five key kind of critical personnel, were they did stay behind with about 30 or so BC wildfire fighters. Um, and uh, what we didn't expect is that they actually ended up getting trapped there uh, overnight. So they had no way to leave. The fire basically consumed the road. All of our egress uh, plans were totally uh, like on fire, not passable. Um, it actually, the fire took out a bridge that accessed our site. So um, the following day, I think they're on site for over 30 hours. Um, the following day, the Wildfire services were able to get out, so they kind of convoyed up north, so took a pretty huge detour to get back to kind of the, the Shushwap area. Uh, and then our employees, we actually evacuated them by boat. So um, once the fire rolled through, it kind of 24 hours later, it settled in our area, and then we were able to come up with our kind of post-fire monitoring. So even though the, the main event rolled through, there was still risk. Um, there was still active fire. It wasn't as intense, but there was still active fire. So uh, we had a plan in place to have a kind of rotating crew, uh, day shift, night shift, do patrols. And um, they were kind of shuttled in by boat for a couple of days until we had access by road from the north end. So pretty challenging, not only, you know, the lead up to the fire, the fire event itself, but for about a week to two weeks after, we still had to manage 
you know, there was still a hazard or still risk there. So we still have to manage on how we kind of continue protecting the site, even though, you know, the big event was over. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm get well, obviously, from what you said, I get the impression that any outside fire departments didn't really have to play a role there either, eh? So no, yeah, because there's so many communities that were affected and homes. We yeah, uh, you know, this was all on us. Like it was up to us to protect this mill, and that's what we did. And you said said you had a bridge, so there was essentially one road into your site, is what you're saying. Yeah, the main road, the paved road, comes from the south, so the bottom of this picture. Uh, that's yeah. the, the kind of main yeah. road. So one bridge there was uh, it was burnt, so that road was inaccessible. And then we do have an alternate route, which is up north. So where my cursor, you can kind of see the roads cut out here. Um, that's a it's a kind of a mainline forestry road. Um, so it's not paved and not a not a super fun drive. So yeah, those are the two. And and then, okay. yeah, and then just one final question after going through all of this, is there anything that became glaring to you kind of after the fact that, hey, for next time we should do this or we should do that? Anything big, like that? The biggest thing is, I don't know, I think if you think it's not going to happen, that's the wrong way of thinking because uh, I didn't think this could happen. And it did, and it was pretty intense. And uh, I think it surprised a lot of people here. Um, so don't get complacent, um, prepare for the worst because the worst it can and it probably will happen at some point. So I think that was our biggest thing is just don't let complacency set in. All the work that you're doing or planning to do, it, you know, ho hopefully it doesn't have to pay off, but if you're in this situation, You'll be glad that you did spend the money, the time, the resources to kind of prepare yourself. Um, so, you know, this was Adams Lake. We have two other sites in BC Interior. Um, you know, after this, the learning was, okay, well, you know, what were the key things that we learned here and how are we going to apply them at our other two sites in British Columbia? Um, and that includes having the right equipment ready to go, uh, drills conducted, ERP plans set up. So, you know, following this, there's been a ton of work to just kind of prepare for the worst in all of our operations. Awesome, thanks, Daniel. Good feedback. Thank okay, you. Zach, uh, you've got your hand up. It's actually Victor. Hi there, Daniel. Um, the picture that you have up now, that's obviously the before picture. You wouldn't happen to have an after picture, would you? I don't have, I wish, I was hoping I would for this presentation, but uh, uh, okay. all the green that you see is now black. <laughs> <laughs> that's. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but I, I was just checking to see if you had one. It's, yeah. it's 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 too bad. It's too it's way too beautiful out there for that to happen. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely it looks different. And even still when I drive to work, it's I'm still not used to it. It's pretty uh pretty sad looking. So Daniel, I have a, a question. You talk about the preparation for the other sites and having equipment uh, and everything ready. What's the key equipment that possibly people can take away that they might want to consider um, to, to get ahead of time that might be difficult to get at the time. Yeah, for sure. So water supply is key, right? So, you know, we're fortunate we're on a lake with good pumps. Um, you know, our other, we have another mill in the interior that is not really close to any access to water. So relying on city water services. So just understanding your your like water supply and capacity and and even testing that out like you know we tested our when we hooked up all the sprinklers we tested like ran them all just to see if we have pressure drops and if our system can actually keep up to the demand um so understanding your supply and your constraints there and kind of what your contingencies are and then for equipment for us it's ensuring that we had not only the sprinklers and the hoses but you got you got to set them up because you might be missing a fitting or you might have the wrong adapters. So it's ensuring that you have not just the like the big hard good equipment, but also the little stuff like the all the fittings and tools and things like that. So um, last year, like 2022 is when we first purchased uh, a few Fireballs units, kind of like, you know, let's buy these and hopefully they're a waste of money. They weren't. <laughs> But uh, we did some drills and uh, realized, oh, 
crap, like we can't even hook these up. We don't have the right adapters. So um, I'd say those are kind of the, the key learnings is just, you know, you can buy all the stuff you want, but you got to test it out and try using it to ensure that it's actually going to work when a crisis does come. Uh, that's great, Darren, because I, I believe that uh, doing the drills for, for not only the wildfires, but for other stuff is an important aspect of being prepared for uh, some of the events that can happen in operations. So, way to go. Awesome. Okay, uh, any other questions? So I'd like to thank Daniel for this presentation. It was very informative and I think it's probably given a, a lot of people some information for them to, to go and mull over and decide, well, do we buy some of those fancy sprinklers or what do we do? Um, you know, it's uh, now's the time for, for, to prepare, I guess, for for the for that type of event, uh, and don't wait until, you know, July. Um, so, if you're thinking of wanting to do something, now's the time to do it. So, I'd like to pass it over to Tom. Tom, you said you had something to say. Sure. Well, thanks very much, Bill, and thanks very much to all the presenters today. Um, this is why we do. Uh, these regular meetings to share uh, key learnings, ways that we can improve our health and safety and uh, be effective in preventing um, potential concerns like forest fires as uh, they may occur. Uh, I, I just wanted to start out with by thanking Bill and BC Forest Safety Council for all their support in these ongoing meetings. They've been very beneficial and of course Tammy as part of that uh, team as well. Um, I wanted to pass along that I'll be retiring on May uh, 17th so I'll be passing the gauntlet here to uh, Chris Serator um, who is uh, one of our directors for uh, health and safety services here in uh, in Ontario and Chris will be taking the lead for the forestry side of things for workplace safety north and will be working with Bill in the future coordinating future meetings like this. Um, I just wanted to um, just uh, thank everyone for your ongoing participation. This makes a difference and sharing this information and opening our eyes a bit more of what potentially could happen and how to prevent that is how we, we get better. Um, this has been a great opportunity and i uh, just like to thank everyone and wish you the best of luck moving forward. Thanks, Tom. And we'd like to extend uh, our thanks for the work that you put into it, uh, you know, uh, Rob, uh, Tammy, myself, you know, we we really appreciate uh, the fact that we can we can uh, have these meetings and share things across the country, and it can only happen when there's somebody like yourself at the at the other end of the country that can can help uh, uh, get things set up like that. And so, thank you very much for the work that you've put into it. It's it's meant a lot to us, and um, we wish you all the best in your retirement. Uh, I'm envious. Uh, so, <laughs> and also we want to welcome uh, Chris. Uh, you know, it's it's always nice when you uh, pass the, the baton on to somebody else, and you're actually still there to provide support. Uh, uh, Chris, we look forward to working with you, and I'm sure that we can continue these on and and still mm -hmm. provide some pretty good information for everybody involved that that likes to participate. Tammy, do you any have anything you want to say? You're, you're, you're muted. It's been a pleasure working with you. Congratulations on your <laughs> retirement. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank you, everybody. Uh, I believe uh, this was uh, some great information shared by both sides. That's that's really important. It's very timely and it's it's given us all a time to to think and possibly plan before the wildfire season really uh, gets underway, although it already has started in BC in some areas. So uh, thanks a lot and good luck on the future, Tom, and uh, we'll be keeping in touch, Chris. Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody a lot, for participating. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now. Great meeting.